Dr. Eric Helms, you're one of the biggest experts in the world on building muscle. I have what's known as the muscle and strength pyramid. Um, ironically, this was something that I created all the way back in 2012 through 14 because people didn't have a lack of knowledge, but they were not able to put all of those pieces of knowledge in context and prioritize them into kind of a usable hierarchy in, say, you know, the hierarchy of evidence. So the base of the pyramid being the most important thing for training is adherence. And one of the biggest issues that I would frequently see is that people would try to construct a quote-unquote optimal program, but it wouldn't align with their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it's because they didn't have the critical thinking skills and the knowledge to know how to adapt a program. So they would go, right, well, here's this five-day-per-week program this pro bodybuilder follows. I have a full-time job, two kids, and prior injuries, and the gym's 45 minutes from my house where I want that stuff to work. It'll go fine, and they are unable to follow it. Volume, intensity, and frequency. Uh, modern data would indicate that when you equate for volume, frequency is not a major player as far as the actual stimulus for strength or hypertrophy, but you absolutely can manipulate volume by manipulating frequency. Volume corresponds to how many sets you do for a muscle in a given training week. What Eric recommends doing starts somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 20 weekly sets for a given muscle. This will be a decent starting place. Around roughly 80% of 1RM it seems to make that relationship between getting closer to failure, inducing more hypertrophy, much less meaningful and potentially maybe not even a, a thing. When you do higher reps, a meta-analysis by our own lab suggests that you tend to overestimate how close to failure you really are. So, Eric recommends training farther from failure earlier when going heavier, perhaps leaving two to four reps in the tank, and pushing a bit closer to failure, perhaps to one or zero reps in the tank when training lighter. Eric also recommends not going to failure on big lower body compound lifts, like squats, since those tend to wreck you for the rest of the workout. So, two to four reps in reserve earlier into a workout for lower body compound movements, for upper body compound movements, around one to three reps in reserve earlier into the workout. From there, for isolation movements performed later into a workout, taking them somewhere between a couple reps in the tank all the way to failure is solid. As far as frequency goes, Eric recommends muscle groups be trained two to three times a week. This could be an upper lower split four days a week, a push pull leg split six days a week for two days of chest training per week, or an upper lower split six days a week for three days of chest training per week. I think this is the one that people get confused about where I, I put progression as the next step up in the pyramid. But people misunderstand progressive overload. Um, especially in the context of hypertrophy, they get really focused on the weight on the bar and they really start to borrow principles from strength training. But for hypertrophy, it's more of a diagnostic tool. I think a good method that works for a lot of different rep ranges is that you don't have to force anything week to week. On lateral raises, for example, every week is nearly impossible. However, if you just add reps for a few weeks before trying to add weight, this becomes much more feasible and easier. Beginners might be able to progress in weight every week. More advanced lifters won't. Exercise selection is the next one we have up in our hierarchy of training. Because clearly, if I was to compare a leg extension to, say, like a lying back, very rare form of a leg extension, we're going to see more rec fem growth. Mm. Or then where you place exercise selection is far less important mm. than things like frequency, volume, and progression. So I think some of the most important things are, one, that it's meets the, uh, I'd say, orthopedic demands of the individual without it creating joint pain, discomfort, or mental fatigue. Can I load this in a sustainable way for my body and mindset? If we can train a muscle to longer length and ideally also place tension at that longer length, that's ideal. Mm -hmm. Now, often you have exercises that will do one but not the other. Um, so generally, you're trying to get as much tension at a longer muscle length as possible. The top two ones of the pyramid are rest periods and tempo. Like if you really, really limit your rest intervals to where you're not even resting, say, a minute or 90 seconds between sets of hypertrophy training exercises. Uh, and we've seen that in multiple studies now. And I think the most recent data would indicate somewhere between one to two minutes is probably sufficient for rest. So generally, I recommend people are resting like, say, two minutes or longer between sets for hypertrophy training. Um, I've talked a lot about antagonist paired sets. There's a recent study that actually did find that antagonist paired sets are a great way to reduce training time without sacrificing hypertrophy. So what's relevant here is that we know eccentrically 
we're typically stronger. When you see someone sink a squat, you don't know if they're going to fail unless they're really overloaded past their capacity. That we can train slower on the eccentric without sacrificing too much performance on the concentric, but there's probably some limit to that. Because the eccentric is under some control, whether it's fast or slow, which the data supports, and then putting maximal effort into the concentric should be your default. He recommended a two to four second eccentric and a concentric that's as quick as possible which usually means around one to three seconds. Have we built the pyramid? We have. And don't let anyone tell you that supposedly Egyptians did this long, long ago. 